That's right. Yeah, that's right. Hi, yeah. Cody. <clears throat> All right, well. All right, so I think I'll start. So we've been learning about the structure of the theory. And the phenomenology is, is which I'm going to do today, is not too impressive. So, but, but nevertheless, content yourself to be the, the structure of the theory. We basically saw that there's two symmetries when you do fermions. So psi prime of x is x prime is psi of x, where x prime and x are general coordinate transformations of each other. So that's yeah, that's a coordinate change where the psi looks like a scalar, and then there's a separate invariance where psi prime of x is some spin transformation on the four vectors. And so roughly these are, tend to be called translation and spin symmetries. Okay. And under them, the, the guys, um, the fields, there's a, there's a tetrad field that transforms with each index. So d x prime mu, d x nu, and then there's a lambda a b, t nu b of x. So if you do both transformations at once, there's that, that guy. And then there's the spin connection this is in the matrix notation, but it's a better way. Prime of X prime is you transform the indices the usual way. And then there's the spin transformation. There's a matrix transformation here. A nu plus S minus 1, D nu S, S minus 1. Okay. And last time, the I was pushing indices around a little too much, I'm sure. It probably didn't make sense of everything. But the key feature is that there's a gauge transformation for each of these. So if I, for the spin transformation, there's an RAB mu nu, which is d mu a nu minus d nu a mu plus a a mu nu minus a a mu nu. And if I put the indices back in here, it's a b, a b, a c, c, b, a c, c, b. That's a field strength tensor for the spin connection. And at the end, I rushed a bit through a field strength tensor for the translation invariance. So T A mu nu was D mu T A nu minus D nu T A mu. And then this guy has the spin connection here on the the Lorentz indices A B mu T nu B minus A A B nu T B mu. Okay, so anti-symmetric field strength tensor. So those guys come out naturally out of these two transformations. So you get gauge transformations and field strength tensors. And T if I take this last guy here, the translation field strength tensor, and I convert that to an, a space-time index by using a tetrad and the A, T, A, mu, nu. That guy equals exactly what we did 
when we connected the spin transformation and the uh, affine connection, this is gamma lambda mu nu minus gamma lambda nu mu. So that guy, which arose naturally in the construction, looks like looks like it's related to the anti-symmetric portion of the connection, which is torsion. Okay, so that's why it, it arises naturally. So this guy has sort of a dual role. The one role is connected to the gauge construction. But another thing, this guy is actually a tensor. And so this is just an extra tensor. So, you know, you can see in discussions that some people just say, ah, it's just a tensor, a tensor field. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not. But it also has this rule that it came out of the, the gauge construction. Okay, so what I'm going to do for the for today is start of today. Anyhow, we'll probably go on to anomalies today. But for the start, I'm going to do a little bit of the phenomenology. Um, and you'll see that much of my role is just complaining about what's done in the literature because I think it's not so great. But taking a look at what's done, here's here's one of the things that you can do. So remember, we had, when I first introduced the torsion, I said that the connection um, can be written as, in terms of these Christoffel symbols, which are just the derivatives of the metric. And then the extra piece here was called contortion, which is was just written as some combination of a torsion tensor. Okay. And so and I also complained that this guy we don't know is normalization, so we could put M squared over T kappa squared. No, actually kappa squared. I put kappa squared over 2m squared in front there if I want to. So I'm going to save that for a minute from now, but let's just let's just go off and do that derivation there. So that's what people tend to do. You do this. So then you say, let's look at r, the curvature. So r uh, lambda sigma mu nu. We can let's call this R zero lambda sigma mu nu, where R zero means just the usual one connected with this, with the usual connection. And then there would of course be this next extra piece, and so let's call this little R um, lambda sigma mu nu. Okay, so what is that guy? You, that's then something calculable. Um, R lambda sigma mu nu, the little guy is a covariant derivative on this contortion tensor in an anti-symmetric form. Um, sigma nu, a lambda sigma mu. And then there's two k guys, k, 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 k. Okay, and if I've got my indices right here, I'm, of course, copied this from somewhere. Um, let's see, okay, I want this, sorry. K, lambda is going to be, now lambda is left over. So let's see, I've got K 
Okay. Gamma mu sigma nu gamma. And then mu goes to nu. Lambda gamma gamma nu sigma mu. Okay. That's the interest isn't that much. But then the action. S is you contract all these indices D for X. Um, it's minus two over kappa squared. Let's make it R zero plus little r. And little r is it's two d actually let me not write bother writing the indices on that guy because it's a total derivative so we're not particularly interested in it and then there's just two capital k terms k k k k and if i've got again sigma lambda lambda sigma rho rho and sigma rho lambda sigma lambda rho okay so you get you get the usual piece and then you get terms that are second order in this contortion tensor. Okay, so the, <clears throat> here comes the, the next step is the decomposition of Okay, so for Boston, um, what I did is I, I've just, I'm writing out the action, the general action in terms of the usual thing plus the pieces that depend on the torsion, okay? And I've advertised that I'm gonna make complaints as I go, okay? okay so the, the usual thing that people do at this stage is to take this torsion guy and say, this is a three index tensor with some symmetry properties. I can decompose it into irreducible tensors of, with fewer indices in the following ways. And so here's the decomposition that people do. There's, there's a piece where there's a vector index here, g mu lambda, um, no, t nu, this is t nu minus t lambda g mu nu. So there's a certain symmetries which I haven't bothered saying too much about. And then there's a piece with an, can be written with an epsilon tensor. So it's one sixth is the usual decomposition, epsilon mu nu lambda sigma s sigma. So these guys look like vectors and axial vectors. So actually T is the vector, S is the axial. And then there's a last guy with um, that's a traceless tensor, Q mu nu lambda. And this guy is traceless and symmetric. It's basically the residual. This guy satisfies Q mu nu mu equals zero and epsilon mu nu lambda sigma Q mu nu lambda projected out in the trace piece system projected out. So this is what they do. This guy's an axial you follow things through. This guy's a vector. 
and then and then r this this extra piece turns out to be minus 2 d lambda t lambda so the the total derivative acts on this t variable then it's minus 2 thirds t lambda lambda t lambda plus 1 over 24 s lambda s lambda and a half q mu nu lambda q mu nu lambda this guy sits in the action with basically the Planck mass out in front of it and um, these terms don't have any derivatives in it so one says these look like mass terms and that mass is m Planck up to factors of 1 over root 24. Okay, because you sit in front of it. Of, of it. Okay, but But actually, part of that conclusion is, is obviously spurious because we could have defined, you could have, the normalization could have been different. Okay, so you could have taken this gamma mu nu, gamma nu mu and called it m squared kappa m squared over two um, tau lambda mu nu and then everything would go through just like before except now now the mass is equal m so basically the kappa m squared over two disappears This could be anything. Okay. So certainly the the usual conclusion that the this consists of Planck scale mass is is unjustified. Um, to know this you'd have to know some kinetic energy piece and how how to normalize it. Okay. But squared. Okay, so the next complaint is that there's no reason why we actually should follow this procedure. We, we should be more general. And in fact, somebody's done this. It's, this isn't me. There's a paper I put up there, which is Hayashi and Shirafuji. It's up on the reference list. It's actually a beautiful paper. And they have a series of papers. Um, they realize that there's no, no reason that you have to only include the, the portion of the, the distortion piece that comes out of R. This is a tensor. You know, your, your symmetry doesn't prevent you from having other interactions, um, and so symmetry allows lots of other interactions. Okay, so they do, and this, this, in some sense, is in the spirit of the effective field theory. Whatever is allowed by the symmetry, you should include the the coupling as a possibility. So, for example, you can have the following 
you can have you could have one half d mu s lambda d mu s lambda minus plus mu squared s lambda s lambda with any mu squared that you wanted. Um, you can have the symmetry allows lambda s lambda s lambda squared terms. Basically, you can build a field theory out of the different components of the torsion. Okay. Um, 80s, early 80s, I think. Um, so it's more general. You then have lots of interactions. And there's a very modest amount of phenomenology, considering you haven't seen any deviations. But but the possibilities for a theory that has general covariance and fermions is much larger than you normally think than I ever thought. Okay, so I this I think is a is a Nice paper, and there are references to it. It's it's well known in its own little niche. I didn't know about it until preparing the class. Okay, but then I have another complaint: butt cubed. Okay, um, I actually don't even think that that their work is the right thing to do. This decomposition looks funny. Let me just write odd. Okay. So remember that this the torsion that we started out with, the you knew the anti-symmetric piece was T lambda A, but it was composed of other fields. D mu T A nu minus T nu a mu plus, I don't know, let's just write it as a t minus a t, the, the piece I wrote up there before. Okay, and for Boston's sake, let me just go back up and remember there was this field strength tensor that was for the translation symmetry, the symmetry that was there. That came out as a field strength tensor just naturally out of the construction, but it then when you put the right indices on it's the usual torsion. Okay. Okay. So the the real fields are the 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 um, tetrad and the spin connection. And somehow these have gotten relabeled for example, into that this axial vector S lambda that we had up there. Now, field redefinitions are allowed in the theory, but on, only under certain restrictions. So field redefinitions So in particular, I mean let's just go back and think of this as being the, the fundamental fields both have one vector index. And then there's some space time index up there, one vector index. And then you're decomposing them into things that have three vector indices or epsilon tensors, et cetera. That's a, that field redefinition at the very least looks looks strange because you're allowed to do it. So Hogg's theorem, there's a theorem I talked about in class here. It says you can take some set of fields phi i and write them in terms of some new fields with some nonlinear nonlinear transformation field properties. But there is a constraint on what's allowed as a field redefinition. You just can't do anything. You have to have this guy being equal to one. 
you have to have the same fields at low at lowest order. And certainly that aspect of the field redefinition constraint has not been carried out at all in this because we don't know the whole Lagrangian. Okay. So there, there's my con complaint about this. I actually think that the, this needs to be redone using these guys as the basic fields and just keeping writing the Lagrangian using them. So Hayashi and Shirofuji's work, but staying with those guys. Anyway, but let me go back to what, what's done. Dartmouth guys, are you still there? I've lost one of my computers. Uh, yeah, we're yeah. still here. Okay, good. Um, okay, I, I, I can't see, you probably can't see me either because the other computer died. All right, um, so let's just go back to what the phenomenology normally is. Let's do the coupling to fermions. The, these, this field arose from the interaction with fermions, so it does couple somewhat to fermions. Because that's where we found it. Um, it can be more general than this. So again, in my complaining mode, because you can, this guy's just a tensor, you know, the, you've got a tensor there and you can couple it up as you would any old tensor. But there's sort of a minimal uh, way to do it. So, so the minimal way is you write a Hermitian action. And so you just write the Lagrangian is, is I'm gonna write one half at psi bar I gamma A. Let me just write it as DA minus M. Psi and add the Hermitian conjugate. Okay, so that's the minimal thing you can do. DA, of course, has in it the, so there's the tetrad, um, A mu, there's the derivative, and then there's the S A B, A A B mu, there's the one half there. Okay, S A B is, is, is the sigma matrices, sigma A, B. And so in this particular ordering, there's a gamma matrix and two more gamma matrices next to it. Okay. So in this piece here, there's gamma A, there's a gamma B, gamma C, if you want, and those guys are anti-symmetrized. Um, if you do the Hermitian conjugate out of this guy comes minus gamma, let's write it as C, gamma B, anti-symmetrized gamma A. It's sitting on the other side because the derivative, this guy has the covariant derivative on the psi bar. So the particular combination that comes out there is then equivalent to, if you do all a few intermediate steps there, it's anti-symmetrized in all these indices, A, gamma B, gamma C. And I think I've even got the, I worry about a factor of a third, but I think I'm right. But anyhow, this equals, if you anti-symmetrize three Dirac matrices, you get an epsilon tensor and another Dirac matrix, I epsilon A, B, C, D, gamma D, gamma five. And 
Okay. So you've got the coupling that's anti-symmetric in, in all the indices sitting there. You then go back, go back and plug into torsion. Okay, and so basically it's just a bunch of converting to space time indices. But when we did the decomposition up here, there's a piece that's symmetric in two indices, always. Here's anti-symmetric in all, and this guy was chosen to be anti orthogonal to that. So the outcome is that the coupling is to the axial part, the axial field, but you can see here, this is the axial coupling to fermions. Okay, so the answer is, so here's, let's just do the answer. L, Dirac, the simplest one is then L, no torsion, plus um, it's three quarters, S sigma psi bar gamma sigma gamma five psi. And there's there's the minimal piece. Okay. So it's it's actually remarkable that it only couples to S if you do it as the the minimal. And again now if we uh, if we say this can be rescaled, this rescaling could be kappa squared m squared over two. I can insert it there if I'm doing my rescaling. Okay. The cup, coupling would be, you have that strength. And so the, Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, let's, let's, yeah, you're right. So let's do T sigma A, A, A. Okay. That's how, if I was doing it right, that's it. Yes. But it's still the, the conclusion is, is really just that the torsion couples up only to axial the axial field and the axial charge when done minimally, okay? Now, you, as I said, you can do lots of non-minimal stuff and you can find non-minimal stuff in the literature too. But that's, this is, this is traditional analysis. So traditionally, yeah. Um, well, so, you know, one of the things you could do, um, what some people do is they, they add a new parameter in, in, in sort of like the coupling constant there, and they allow that parameter to, you have a parameter and it's Hermitian, it's allow it to be complex. And so it's like putting CP violation into the coupling. You then can actually get a different linear combinations of this by alpha star a alpha a plus alpha star a star you can actually you actually bring in the the vector piece if you do that yeah so this is i've, I've just split up i've taken the the general spin connection carried along what is the piece that ends up being the torsion and just follow just that piece by choosing this, by making my only coupling being psi plus its Hermitian conjugate, okay? So that's why I mean it's, it's the minimal thing to do. There's non-minimal stuff that you could do also. You can take, if, if you like that decomposition, you could take all those indices, the, the T, the vector piece, and make a direct coupling T 
times the vector current is for the size. You can make the Q coupling. You can just add it in with a uh, with a another. Right. Yeah. So this actually isn't. So once you allow torsion in, you get something. This isn't actually parity violated. No. Um, so so the the question here was is this parity violation? Um, the this is an axial coupling, but this current is like an axial current. So if you couple an axial current to an axial coupling, you're going to get a parity conserving answer. Okay. Okay. So, um, in fact, we will see what it does. You know, at this stage, you can sort of remove the S field. Um, since there's only a mass term there, if you in, if if you take the traditional thing of doing this um, as your action, just like a mass term, and there's a coupling here, there's no derivatives. You can just integrate out the S. Okay, and it looks uh, basically this coupling then is gets the S gets replaced by its equations of motion, which is basically that this is the, happens here. So it's it's basically um, so let's just do it a little bit. Uh, S is integral d four x d. Uh, d for y, x minus y, of this this interaction here, which would be three quarters kappa squared m squared. I'm going to put this in just to make a point. Um, psi bar gamma mu psi, gamma five psi, and let me forget about the tetrad for the moment. So s mu would be would be that, but this if there's no kinetic energy piece is just one over the m squared delta function. That's the no kinetic energy piece. Or if you put a kinetic energy piece and you um, take the mass to be much bigger than the momentum. So the S just turns into, um, it's three over 16, if I got my factors right, kappa squared, phi bar, gamma mu, gamma phi. Psi, which you then plug back into the Dirac equation, so that the the Lagrangian, the Dirac Lagrangian, is no torsion piece, and then it's plus um, looks like nine over um, nine over uh, sixty four. Kappa squared. Uh, I bar gamma mu gamma five psi psi bar gamma mu gamma five psi. So it's the point interaction of two axial currents, one and two, that you get, and the. One of the points I wanted to make, I actually a little worried about my kappa squared there. I'm not sure if that's right, but could be. Um, is that actually this this rescaling that I did? The m squared rescaled the mass, and it rescaled the, the one over m squared has one over little m squared. So that rescaling actually drops out when I do that. Um, and so I guess actually the kappa squared is there. Yes. So this is one over m Planck squared, and so the result is that we've got a point interaction that has axial currents in it that's one over m Planck squared. So pretty boring um, because it's it's immeasurably small. Um, everybody, that's that conclusion is is obviously wrong, and if you are more general like this Hayashi Shirafuji and probably even wrong for other reasons.
but that's that's what's traditionally done. Okay, and the last thing I'd like to do here. Okay, any if there's any questions, I'll take them on that. Okay. Um, last thing I do is the, there's actually a new term in the action that that's interesting and also not very well explored that also can come now Holst it goes by the name of Holst who, who did it and there's a whole new sector which is parity violating and also not that well explored so here's how you construct it um, the whole action is the following is minus one over kappa squared gamma gamma is called this emergency parameter um, integral d4x Square root of minus g. Um, I'm going to do epsilon a b c d r mu nu a b. And I've still got two indices left over. I've got t mu c t nu d. Okay. So, so, you know, you might call this this quantity here R dual. It's like the anti-symmetric anti piece there. Um, so let's just do that. That guy normally vanishes if you just have the the usual connection in there. If you, with torsion, it's not vanishing. If you, if you look at what our dual looks like, it's the derivative <coughs> of epsilon mu nu alpha beta t nu alpha beta where that's the torsion tensor and this must be covariant though I haven't actually checked it but it's this is a total derivative piece anyhow and then there's a piece that looks the piece that's surviving looks like one half epsilon mu nu alpha beta T lambda mu alpha T lambda nu beta, which no, I don't know. This is this would look like FF dual if I went back. Remember, look. Let's just think. Let's go back to that. Um, original definition way up here of T in terms of derivatives. So it sort of looks like, it. that looks like a field strength tensor. Now this is like FF dual for the tetrad field strength tensor. Um, and following the decomposition, which I've complained about, it's a total derivative minus Two S alpha T alpha. Okay, so it mixes vector and axial axial. Okay. Um, and then its phenomenology depends on what you do, what you do with the rest of the sector. You can get parity violation, parity violating couplings um, of the 
the form of vector times axial vector, depending on what you do. And um, there's only one phenomenology paper that I know, and it involves Will's friend Takeuchi. <laughs> so there's a a Friedel, Laurent Friedel, this guy Minich, who was um, Ufuk's thesis at, uh, postdoc supervisor for a while, and Takeuchi. There's some parity violation phenomenology. You can sort of tell on that paper who wrote the phenomenology part and who wrote the theory part. Um, but it basically is a generalization of this, except now you get you get vector and axial vector couplings. But they're again bounded phenomenologically to be smaller than the weak interactions, which isn't a very strong constraint. So, anyway. But that's that's this other sector of the theory. There, I, I'm going to stop this part of the uh, class on on this note here. I don't have much more prepared. For that. Anybody have any questions about this? So there's a whole other sector of the theory which is lightly explored. But clearly you should keep in mind if you're ever doing very high energy stuff involving gravity, you know, if you want to do gravity at high energies, this this should be included because at some scale these degrees of freedom could become relevant. Okay. Larry, Larry Hunter, okay. Yes. Yeah. I have to go read the paper. I, I remember something, but I don't remember exactly what, what the analysis depended on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. Well, do you do you remember remember the content of that paper? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, yeah, it was extremely useful and uh, trying to explain very in general class of that. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it was a paper by Dobreski. Yeah, Dobreski. Well uh, done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. So for the Dartmouth folks, uh, Larry Hunter over at Amherst College has done an experiment using using the Earth as a source, a spinning source, and putting constraints on some aspects of torsion, and we're unable to reconstruct what those aspects are off the top of our head. Um, but since I don't trust anybody's analysis at this stage, it's, I, I'm sure there's, there's something more to be done. Okay. Yeah, RR dual. The, there's, so there's, there is that higher order, there's an RR dual piece, which, which, which the Dartmouth folks probably know better than here because the, the definitive review on that was written by Stefan Alexander. Um, I had some notes prepared on that for a while, but I decided that I'm also going to not continue further down this pathway since I, I would suspect that there's more, more work needs on that to be done on that part also. So that's, that's one at quadratic order. Um, okay. Yeah. The limits are not so great here. Yeah. So it, that's right. So the the limits on RR dual are probably equally 
even weaker. Um, the limits on this this Holtz guy, um, I would think it would be, you know, those could actually be realistic because it's first order. Um, if treated generally, there could be some interesting physics associated with this at a earlier stage because it's the same order as the curvature. So I know Bjorkane was interested in this for a while. I haven't seen anything written, but aside from a talk where he said he's interested in it. So maybe the phenomenology didn't pan out in, in any particular way, but, but okay. Good. Anything else? All right. So I'm gonna now do a section on anomalies. And and so the so just as a preview, we have after today there's five classes. Anomalies and Hawking radiation are on the, the map. So it's clear that I have to start compressing. But however, anomalies are such a general an important aspect of field theory in general that in the quantum field theory two portion of this course I can't completely ignore them. But here's the, there's three types of anomalies that we often talk about. There's scale anomalies, which is the trace anomaly. There's Related to that are conformal anomalies, which is where gravity comes in. And that's also a related to all these conformal field theories now. So I want to do that. I want to do trace anomalies. The, the most phenomenology, the one with the best phenomena, phenomenology is the axial anomaly. But I, I won't do that one um, just because of time reasons. So I'll say something, but I'm not going to do too much. Okay. But conformal is where gravity comes in, traces the lead up to that. And there's four ways that I know of to present this. Okay. I'm going to do two of these four ways. So the, the path integral way matches with the way we've been presenting this course. So I'll do path integrals. I'll try to do that at a reasonable order. Okay, then there's Feynman diagrams. I'll say some things about Feynman diagrams, but I'm not going to do a full treatment. Then Bossom knows that we now have a new way of doing it with non-local actions. This also matches with what we were doing so far, so I will say something about that. And then the fourth way is dispersion relations. And when I do the trace anomaly, I'll say something about it, but I'm not going to do much. I'm just going to quote some stuff from the paper that did it. So. No, that's basically just Feynman diagrams. He's, he, he's just regularizing Feynman diagrams by point splitting. Um, so the the interesting feature about this is that these two guys, the first two, focus on the, the ultraviolet parts of the theory, and the last two focus on the infrared parts of the theory. And so they look quite distinct, but that's what it is. So, all right. so as for readings, I did put the chapter three from from the dynamics of the standard model onto the web page. So if you want to have readings which match the way I treat the path integrals here, um, you can take a look at that. 
Okay. So let's, let's do the path integrals. Let's, how do you do currents and path integrals? Okay. Well, we were defining a generating functional that ha has some sources in it. I'm going to leave a little space there. It's the path integral over some fields. Here's being general. E, e to the i into a d4x. Lagrangian. And then you add sources to do take matrix elements for by functional differentiation. And you can add the currents that you're interested in. Um, so V mu is going to be the, the current. And I'll add a source associated with that J mu. So this is my source. And this is some current that I'm interested in. Okay. So J, J mu, um, V mu. Actually, I have it backwards. Uh, sorry, notation is backwards. But there's the source, and there's the current. Okay. So if I wanted to take, um, I can differentiate this with respect to. Uh, Z of with respect to this source V mu of X. Um, it said V mu equals to zero. Take one over Z, D by DZ, V. This gives me a matrix element, like uh, something that I can calculate, which contains all the matrix elements that I, I'm interested in. Of, of, of whatever that current J mu is. In particular, if I wanted to get, for example, if, let's say I wanted to get some time order product J mu phi phi, I just take two more de de derivatives, i delta squared delta j of x delta j of y of this j bar of x of z. I know. Okay. So if I want to get a matrix element, I just differentiate respect to my my field variable, and I've got my my matrix element. So the basic point is, if I add a source coupled up to my current, I can play and find aspects of the matrix. Okay. So what what I'm after here is what's the condition for a current being conserved and the current being not conserved. Okay. So here's another theorem. You know, this current, which follows from the Lagrangian. So basically, if if phi goes to phi prime, which is phi plus epsilon, sometimes some f of phi, is a symmetry. Then you you convert epsilon into epsilon of x. The current that you're after, j mu, is the derivative of the Lagrangian with some phi prime with respect to d mu epsilon, so that the space-time dependence of epsilon. And so that's how you identify your current. Or for us, the statement is going to be L 
of phi prime d mu phi prime equals L of phi d mu phi plus j mu d mu epsilon. So that's how you pick out. At this stage, I'm going to go back to path integrals, and I'm going to use this. So from from that guy there, that I just started up above. Um, I would have that log of z. I can, I'm going to try rewriting this as an inner equation. Z of v plus delta. V, well, here's this is in general delta v, v, v mu minus log z of v mu. This is just writing the differentiation as integral equation is minus i integral d4x j bar of x delta v uh, of x. This definition of j bar as the differential 1 over z the derivative respect of v is equivalent to this integral equation right there. Okay. If I then take delta v mu is v mu epsilon, just this is now, that was true for in general for any variation, delta v mu is v mu epsilon. I then have log z v mu, actually I have minus v mu epsilon, sorry, minus log z of v equals minus i integral d for x j bar d mu epsilon and I integrate this by parts so there's the d mu epsilon I integrate this by parts is minus i integral d4 x epsilon of x d mu j bar mu So this tells us that if we have a symmetry where the test of the symmetry is is z d mu minus d mu epsilon minus z or equals z of v mu. If that's true, then all these matrix elements, the whole matrix element, implies d mu j bar v mu. So all matrix elements of j equals zero. Okay. So let's apply that symmetry test and see what's what's needed. Okay. So Z of V mu minus d mu epsilon is the integral d phi d 
e to the i integral d four x l of phi d mu phi minus v mu minus d mu epsilon j mu this guy here is plus d mu epsilon j mu there, there's this new piece um and the question is, is this equal to Z of V mu? Okay, the, the way that you can make the argument that it is, is to go back up to our definition of what the current was L plus J D mu epsilon is, is L of um, phi prime D mu phi prime. So I go down here, I say, this guy is the integral D phi E to the I integral D four X L of phi prime D mu phi prime minus V J mu. And this almost looks like my original Lagrangian. All I have to do to make it look like um, the original is to say that I'm integrating over all phi's. That's the equivalent to integrating over all phi primes. Equals that. And then this is just Z of V mu. Okay. So we see that there's an two conditions for the invariance. The first condition in path integral treatment is the invariance of the Lagrangian L of phi prime d mu phi prime equals L of phi d mu phi plus j mu d mu epsilon. This is the statement of invariance. If epsilon of x just becomes a constant. Okay, so the Lagrangian is invariant. Then when epsilon is a constant. Okay. But the second condition, two, the second condition is d phi equals d phi prime. And this is the condition that's violated when there are anomalies. So anomalies are then classical symmetries of the Lagrangian, but they're not symmetries of the path integral. The path integral implies they're not quantum symmetries. So the path integral treatment then um, takes 
takes that as its starting point. Um, we're going to look at whether there are symmetries of the Lagrangian and symmetries of the path integrals. 